It's good to see all of you here. It's also good to have you joining us online for this service. We're glad you're joining us via that media. Um, also, welcome to Watertown and to uh, Aberdeen and also here on SA joining us online today. We pray you have a, a great experience also. And I have to do this too. Welcome, great room. Even though they're just across the hall. We're glad you're joining us uh, via video this morning. Um, I just want to say a couple things before I jump into the message. I think Pastor Aaron, first of all, covered this stuff super well, so I'm not going to cover any of that. But this whole uh, incident with George Floyd and what's going on there, I, I want to encourage you, church, be slow to speak and quick to listen to others, okay? It's our natural tendency to speak before we really heard the story of other people, especially those different from us. And one of the things I'm, I'm beginning to realize again in my own life through this whole incident is this, that we need to really hear the story of other people's lives and empathize with them first before we begin to speak into some issues that maybe we don't have the full story on. So in this whole thing, just pray a lot, ask uh, God to give you a heart that's gracious towards others and be slow to speak, but quick to listen uh, to others. In fact, I think... If we're really going to serve our culture well, what I'm going to talk with you on in this message is, is of paramount importance and very relevant to the time we find ourselves in. Last week, we begin to learn that at the core of the ministry of Jesus Christ uh, is a servant heart. When he knew that he had come from God, he was going back to God, that all things were put under his power. The most godly thing that he could do at that very moment, knowing that he had all these resources at his disposal, was to what? Wash his disciples' feet. Of all the things he could do, he washed his disciples' feet. And then he looked at his disciples and he said to them, I have set an example for you to follow. You do the same thing one to the other. And what he was doing in this encounter was teaching the disciples and teaching us into a new paradigm of spirituality, what it really means to be a follower of God. What he was teaching us into was this, you do best when you embrace a servant attitude. You do best when you embrace a servant attitude. Now earlier in the book of John, in John chapter 10, verse 10, he has told us, I've come to give you life and life to the full. Now what he's doing here in John 13 is he's fleshing that out for us. You want life to the full? full? This is what it looks like. Serve me like I have served you. Serve one another like I have served you. See, a servant heart is a pathway to blessing. A servant heart is a pathway to blessing. And if that be the case, which I of course think it is because Christ said it was, then you and I need to begin to ask ourselves, how do I live in such a way that I am living with a servant heart? It's not an activity we do every now and then. It's not something we say, okay, I did that, I'm done, now I can go back to my life. It is who we are to become. It's how we're to express our Christian faith. So for those of you who heard last week's message, we all can hear the message. It's on video, right? We have no excuse. Amen? It's a pastor's delight now. Oh, I'm sorry, pastor. I was busy on Sunday. No, 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 no. You can just pull it up on your computer anytime, right? Amen? And you can watch it. It's great. I kind of like it, actually. You know what? It's what's a strange experience for me. It's the first time in 23 years that I had two months of Sundays free. Well, I watched the service, too. But it was such a, wasn't that a strange experience, Pastor Aaron? It really was different, a different experience. I kind of liked it. I can't, I don't want to admit that. Anyway, um, <laughs> but at any rate, so for those of you who watched last week's message, I challenged you to pray for ways to serve that this last week. Have you been doing that? Have you been asking God, grace me, grace me to truly have a servant heart? Because Jesus said, it's one thing to know these things. You're blessed what? If you do them, if you truly serve. Now, when I came to the subject matter of service in John chapter 13, I thought, there's no way I can cover this in one week and do it justice. So we're going to cover it once again this morning. Uh, I'm going to tackle the subject matter again. But last message, we looked at it from this kind of spirituality side. 
Jesus is establishing this new paradigm. We need to step into this new paradigm. Today, you know what I'm going to look at it from? I'm going to look at it from the way it affects you and I. We do best when we serve God. And there are a couple reasons why we do best when we serve God. And I want to flesh those out with you in this message uh, today. And so I'm going to read from John chapter 13 once again, but I'm only going to read a limited amount of the scripture today, okay? I'm going to skip over large segments of it. But get this. I, I, I can speak from my personal experience. This scripture that I'm sharing with you today has profoundly changed me as a follower of God and what I think true spirituality really is. And what I pray is that it profoundly changes you also. At the core of Christ is the servant heart. If we're going to follow Christ, then at the core of our being has to be a servant heart also. Now listen to John chapter 13. I'm going to read verse 1 through 5, then I'm going to jump down and read verse 12 through 17. Here we go. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he'd come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped the towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now jumping down to verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So, as I said, last week we looked at this scripture and we majored on the spiritual implications, this new paradigm that Christ established. In this message, I'm going to look at why we should serve, why we should have a servant heart, and how that is the best way to do our Christian faith, the best way to express it. So, there are two reasons to serve. Let me just give you the first reason, and I'm going to spend a lot of time explaining this reason. And It's going to kind of go all over the place, all right? But I will bring it to closure, amen? And so if you're super linear, I'm sorry. Just deal with it, amen? If you're a rambler, you'll just love this, what's going to happen over the next few moments. But serving is a means to humility. And this opens you then to the power of God. I'm going to say that again. Serving is a means to humility, And this opens you to the power of God. When Jesus washed his disciples' feet, it was during the last supper meal. They sat down, right? They were eating together. uh, And there's all this conversation that's transpiring. In fact, a lot of John uh, chapter 13 and on is really the conversation that was happening during this meal time, right? Elsewhere in the Bible, like over in Luke chapter 22, the same thing is talked about, this last supper, this last meal. Only in that particular instance, the conversation that was recorded is a little bit different, a little bit more succinct, and we use it now as a model for communion. We've taken that Luke 22 scripture, and and we've turned it into our communion observance, that sacrament. And and the Last Supper, as noted in in Luke chapter 22, it says, Jesus broke the bread, and he said, this is my body given for you. In the like manner, later on during that meal, he took the cup of wine, he drank it, and he said, this is my blood also poured out for you. So let me ask you a question now. You, You got this foot washing thing going on. You got this... What? Passover meal going on that's being converted into what we now call communion, the the, the sacrament. All this is kind of a sacred event. All these things are happening, right? It's really cool. So how would you respond if you were a disciple present for these things? How do you think the disciples respond? Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. Judas Iscariot was that person. We know that. And after he says this, this is what the disciples begin to talk about in Luke chapter 22, verse 24 through 26. I I just got to share this with you. A dispute 
also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Stop and think about that. Think about the irony of it. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentile lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you're not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. He's a lot more patient than I am. I think I would have said, are you kidding me? Some of you know me really well. I say that a lot. Did you not just get what I talked about? Did you not just understand what we went through? Have you just blown through all these moments? Something was not clicking with the disciples. By the way, this kind of thing happened with the disciples a lot. And I'm going to say this in love. It happens to us a lot too. We blow right through the moments that Christ wants us to get and we just don't get it very easily. Over in Mark chapter 9, verse 33, we're told that when they had come to Capernaum, Jesus asked the disciples, what, are you, what were you arguing about on the road as we walked? And a lot of you know this scripture. They were arguing about who was the greatest. And Jesus told them this, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And then he gives an object lesson. He pulls a little child over and says, you've got to become like one of these. And in that culture, the, a child was considered the lowliest of lows. So they were just a little kid. It's not like our culture. I still think they valued their kids, but they were considered lowly, okay? You've got to become lowly, he's saying. And once again, over in Mark in chapter 10, verse 35, we read that James and John came to Jesus and said, I want to sit at your right hand, and I want to sit at your left hand in your kingdom. And he goes, do you understand what you're asking? Can you take the cup I'm going to take? Can you take the baptism I'm going to take? And they both said, yeah. And he said, yeah, you will. Meaning that they would suffer and die also like he would suffer and die. And then the other 10 disciples hear about the request of these two disciples. And the word indignant sticks out to me. They were indignant. Not because of the wrongness of the request. Because they thought they were pretty good too. They just tended to not get what Christ was talking about. Listen to what Jesus says in that particular case in Mark chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 42 through 45. Listen to this. This is going to sound familiar. It's like a broken record. Jesus called them together and said, you know that, that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be the first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so we're at this Last Supper event. We have this foot washing. We have this institution of what we now observe as communion. And the disciples are arguing, once again, who's the greatest? It reminds me of little kids. My dad's bigger than your dad. My mom's stronger than your mom. I play basketball better than you play basketball. I run faster than you run. And it's like Peter says, you know, I was the one that confessed he is the Christ. After all, I'm a pretty big deal. Well, John and James said, we're the thuns of thunder. We're a pretty big deal too here. And these guys are totally going down this self-absorbed, self grandizing kind of path. And Jesus is saying to you, you got to understand the greatest in God's kingdom will be the servant of all. They've just gone through this wonderful foot washing experience. The Lord took off his outer garment, wrapped himself in a towel and humbled himself and washed their feet and said, I'm setting an example for you. And he's previously talked on the subject matter with him multiple times. And he's now saying at the end of all this, you, you got to get the lesson I'm teaching you because it's one thing to hear me. It's another thing to do what I'm telling you you to do. So we're back to the reason why we should serve. Why is servanthood such a big deal? Here's why. It works in you humility. And when you're a humble person, that's when God unleashes his power into your life. And Jesus knew that. It works in you humility. And that humility is this fertile operating condition for the Holy Spirit to empower you. That, my friends, is why service and a servant heart is so incredibly important to the Christ follower. Have any of you ever been to a foot washing? Anybody? 
You can raise your hand if you're here. If you're at home, online, you can raise your hand. You know, there's no one there going, oh, you shouldn't raise your hand. It's just you and maybe your family. You know, it's pretty safe, right? Have any of you been to a foot washing? Yeah. You know, I've seen them at weddings. Oh, it's so pretty. They get this nice little stainless steel basin that looks like this, you know. And, of course, the groom and the bride have probably washed five times before the wedding, so they're pretty clean. And they just beautiful. They wash each other's feet, and they longingly look in each other's eyes, lovingly. I'm going to serve you the rest of my days. I'm not trying to be sarcastic, although I am. <laughs> it, totally, it totally is not what foot washing is about. It was gross. Amen. Their feet were dirty. If you're going to foot wash somebody, you're going to get messed up a little bit. Your hands are going to get dirty, and it's not going to be all that sweet and, and comforting. Um, they were washing dirt from their feet. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a slave process. Now, I have no problem. Some of you men can relate to me on this, and maybe you women. My wife's feet are cute. Honey, I love you. She's online today. She's cute feet. I'll grab her feet. That doesn't bother me one bit. Do I want to grab your foot? Not at all. It's like weird. And it grosses me out. You know, we have the same kind of hang-ups and wrong thinking in our time that the disciples had in their time. Um, we, we have the wrong thing of what we think is great. I'm going to get back to the foot washing thing again. Again, I'm telling you, I'm meandering a little bit. Are you okay? I'm just meandering. It's been so long since I've been around uh, other human beings that, uh, and I've been talking to a camera. Amen, Aaron? We get done with that and we go, oh my goodness, that was a terrible experience. You know, although I'm, I love you guys online. I love you. So I'm learning. Kyle's teaching me. He's slowly morphing me to know what it means to speak online a little bit. Um, but anyway, we, we exalt the wrong things in our culture all the time right now. We look at someone and say, wow, look how pretty they are. Look how handsome they are. And we exalt their good looks. We exalt somebody because of their charisma or they're a smooth speaker. And I remember listening to some preachers when I began to do ministry, um, trying to learn from them. And man, some of them were just really, really gifted, great speakers. And I thought, I'll never do that, so don't worry about it. Um, and we think these things make uh, people great. Um, during COVID-19, there's been no live sports. So I've been watching all the great games of the past to the point I'm nauseous. But, you know, and then we, we had the, we had the uh, last dance on about the Chicago Bulls, who were my favorite team growing up, and um, seeing them and Michael Jordan. And so we exalt that as being great. And here's the problem when we exalt the wrong things as being great. Then it goes right into the church. And we think, well, I can't serve because I don't have any talents. I'm not articulate. I'm not smooth talking. But you know what? We have it all wrong. It's all about a willing heart and a submissive spirit and serving Christ in humility. And then God pours his grace out into our lives. And that's what makes a person great, amen, in God's kingdom. It's not your charisma. It's not your good looks, although you're good looking. It's your willing heart and your humility. You know, like I said, foot washing is a messy deal. Jesus wrapped the towel around himself because it's a messy deal, right? So he put this towel around his waist and he, and he washed their feet and, and he wiped it off with the towel around himself. Now, I, I tell you what, um, I'll give you the point. One with a servant heart is willing to get in there and get messy for the cause of Christ, okay? Just, it's a messy thing. Here, here's my scrub brush. If I was going to wash your feet, I'd say put it in there and I'd because I don't want to get too close. And that's kind of how a lot of us do our Christianity and service. But I'll, I'll help. I just don't want to get too close. Because when you really serve and when you're really humble and we're really trying to do the will of God, it's a messy business. And you're going to get messed up and things aren't going to be all that neat and clean. So we're going to give each one of you who are here today an opportunity. You're finally back in person, right? So what we're going to do now is I'm going to have the archers come in with a whole bunch of basins of water and cloths. And you're going to wash each other's feet. You okay with that? And we're going to pass it down the row. And you're going to wash the person to the left of you feet. Y 
You should see your looks right now. I'm just playing with you. I'm not going to do that. We don't have time. At any rate, did you notice that you just entered into the moment, that you entered into the uncomfortableness of serving? It's messy. I wanted to get you emotionally just stirred up here a little bit. Um, and there's two reasons you don't want to do that. Foot washing thing. One, you want nobody touching your feet. Two, you don't want to touch anybody else's feet. You know what the problem is? Your dignity. You want to maintain dignity in following Christ, and you can't. And Christ was saying to his, his disciples, if you're going to follow me, you're going to become undignified. You're going to become a servant of all. You're going to humble yourself. Serving, my friends, is not glamorous. It's dirty, and it's messy, and it's not neat and clean. I see some try to make serving neat and clean. I hear the term all the time used this way. I'm a servant leader. Yeah, what does that mean? Usually it means this. I'm going to serve at a distance. I'm going to maintain my leadership kind of hat, and I'm going to do the serving thing so I feel good about myself, but I'm going to do it in a way kind of, kind of maintaining position and, and kind of maintaining some dignity. I'm going to tell you what. If you're really going to serve God, you forget your dignity. Humble yourself and follow him. You can't do it at a distance. And I tell you, I like distancing. I kind of like some of the COVID-19. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm very Norwegian at heart. Six feet, I think, should be ten. Amen? (laughs) And sometimes Christianity, we just have to get uncomfortable and get messy. We have to be closer than we want to be. It's not a comfortable thing. So here's a challenge question for you, and I'm going to move along really quickly. Will you move from comfort to pursuit of God's will? Will you have a servant heart as part of your DNA? I want to talk to your heart for just a moment. You can't serve for recognition. You've got to serve because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. The best way you serve often will go unnoticed by most people, but it'll change you and it will change those around you. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was uh, talking to his disciples and he says, don't do your acts of righteousness to be seen by men because then you're going to get your reward. He said, don't do us the hypocrites. And I've talked about this before. And in fact, I've used my horn before. The hypocrites would do their, their giving this way. They would go to a street corner and they would toot their horn. They would toot a trumpet. And they would say, look at me. I'm going to give to the poor. And they would Toot their own horn. In fact, that's probably where the saying comes from, tooting your own horn, right? And and Jesus says, such a one has already received the reward, the recognition of people. But he said, but when you do your giving, give in secret. So only your father knows what's going on. Serve without the need of recognition. Serve because it humbles you and God's powerful will fall into you and it'll change you and it'll change others. By the way, if your kid has a horn like this, you can talk about tooting your own horn. What a great object lesson. Amen, parents? Some of the kids just finally woke up. So it's strategically placed in the message, trust me. I've had six kids. But now, if you have kids with you, I'm sorry. And they're getting pretty much antsy. But get to point two here and then we're going to wrap up. Christ-like service changes you and others. That's why it's so important. And I'm not going to talk much on this point. Christ-like service changes you and it changes others. And it did really change the disciples. It did really get through to them. After Christ's death and after his resurrection and after they were filled with the person of the Holy Spirit, we see these disciples without exception serve God with all their heart and soul to the point that they basically all died serving Christ. They were drastically changed. And they just served him as part of who they were and how they did the Christianity. Now listen, if you serve out of compulsion... Your attitude's going to be sour. That won't change you. If you serve out of coercion, you're going to be resentful. That attitude won't change you. But if you serve because you truly want to please your Lord and you truly love others, that will bring glory to Jesus Christ. That will open you up to the power of God residing in you, and it'll open others up to really experiencing the true love of Jesus Christ. Francis of Assisi said this, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary at times, use words. Now I want to get practical, and then we're going to wrap it up. When I talk on service, I can't help but remember my days at 3M, and of course my days pastoring. But when I worked at 3M, I really asked myself frequently, how do I serve you, God, here, and how do I bring glory to you here? And I was blessed to have, by and large, pretty good bosses and pretty good coworkers. But there's always that bugger or two, amen? And you ask, well, how, how do I do this? How do I really serve you, God, in a situation when my coworkers aren't very godly and my boss is, is a stinker? First of all, who do you serve? 
Jesus Christ. In all circumstances, you serve Jesus Christ. And you're called to serve him. So no matter what, you work as unto the Lord. We had a saying with our kids whenever we asked them to do something around the home. This is a great saying. I've shared it before. Vicki instituted this saying. It was part of the Norby standard nuance, standard exchange with children. Do whatever you do, do it with a happy face and a happy heart as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Happy face, happy heart unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'd go to work and say, oh, I've got to have a happy face with these people that aren't very happy. I gotta have a happy heart, seriously. I can do the unto the Lord thing, that's spiritual, amen, amen. But really, with a happy face and a happy heart. It, and it just changed how I would look at things. It, 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 and so just seek to exalt Christ in all your actions, in all your words, in all your demeanor. Um, the stuff that Pastor Aaron and I talk with you about week after week after week after week, you have to do it. With a happy face and a happy heart, Unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what Ephraim Smith said. He said, remind the already church people coming alongside you that they are the servants, not the customers. So I'm reminding you of that this morning. You are the servants, not the customers. Listen to this. The church becomes powerful and unstoppable when we lose the customer attitude of serve me and accept the biblical mandate of serve others. And the COVID-19 has been a perfect storm for trying to live that out. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to skip the rest of the stuff I'm going to share with you today because as usual, I wrote way too much. And I want to encourage you to go to Romans chapter 12 and just read the first few verses there and, and say, okay, if I'm going to have a servant attitude of, uh, and serve God, then you need to take to heart what it means to be a living sacrifice, what it means to have sober self-judgment going on, being humble, and what it means that God has endued us with spiritual gifts, it's talked about in Romans 12, so that we can serve effectively. So what, 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 why I wanted to share, share that, and I don't really have time, but for, from Romans 12, what we see is it starts out kind of following what I've just talked with you about today. If, if you really want to do well in following the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, you're going to realize it's all about a servant heart. It's all about humility, sober self-judgment. And it's all about then being in a place where God's grace and power can flow into your life, and you can serve then in the grace and the sufficiency of the Holy Spirit. But let's go to the conclusion here. Offer yourself today as a living sacrifice to God. Being a servant and having a servant attitude means, God, I live and move and have my being in you, and I'm offering myself to you as a living sacrifice. That's what our culture needs right now. We don't need more you know, words and more phrases. What we need is a whole bunch of people out there who are being so changed and so renewed in their mind and so, so you know, enlightened by the person of the Holy Spirit that these ones truly are loving their neighbor as themselves. That's what we need right now, amen? That's what we need. That's what our culture desperately needs to see. So if you've been following us along here for the last few months, you know that there's a together at home, Discipling with family and friends part of your note guide. So if you picked one up, I would encourage you to talk with your children about that, talk with a friend or your spouse uh, 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 using this, this, this uh, resource. If you're online, I would encourage you to go to our webpage, go to the media section and, and pull up the bulletin for the message today and, and look at Together at Home, Discipling with Family and Friends. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads? And then Pastor Aaron, or not Pastor Aaron, Trace Timo come back up. Let's, uh, I'm not used to this being live, sorry. Um, let's, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for uh, this day. I feel like I kind of put our mouth to the proverbial fire hydrant today and just blasted through a whole bunch of super important uh, reasons why we should embrace a servant attitude of our hearts. What I want to pray for, Lord, is just openness to this concept today by all here it, it present physically and all here joining us online. I just pray, Lord, that we would just desire to serve you in thought, word, and deed. I, I, I think, Jesus, the closer I've grown to know you in my life, the more I see it's less about me and more about you. So would you grace us, Lord, with humble hearts, first of all? It's just such fertile soil to be humble. It's, it's that place where it's not about self anymore. And in that place, we're liberated from the restraints of, of, of you know, 
self-gratification. Uh, and it becomes this, this freeing moment, Lord, just to dwell in you in fullness. And then you impart to us power, your, your presence, gifts of the Holy Spirit that talk, that's talked about in Romans chapter 12 so that we can become what we're meant to become, Lord. And then the, the, the irony is that as we humble ourselves and, and let you be exalted in our lives and it becomes more and more about you, Lord God, life becomes full and rich like you promised in John 10.10. 10, and we experience truly what it means to live the, a life in you and a life to the full, Lord. It just seems ironic that you have to kind of diminish personally for you to increase Jesus, but that's the, that's the kingdom principle here. Lord, and I just pray for us to understand that in you oftentimes down is up and less is more. And help us to step into that, Lord, and embrace it and be okay with it. I pray these things in your precious name today, Jesus. Amen.